Welcome back, geology fans. We move on from the 65.5 million year old asteroid impact that killed the non-avian dinosaurs off, stepping out of the Mesozoic, the age of middle life, or the age of reptiles, into the Cenozoic, the age of recent life, or the age of mammals. We hike to the cottonwood trees at the base of a dark mass of exposed rock. Using local landmarks, we locate ourselves here, on our map, and, as always, start with the big picture first. We note the rock's darker color and relative resistance to weathering. Biologically, we see that grass grows on the Denver Formation, but not on this rock unit, yet cottonwood trees, which require significant water, and are thus usually found in local creek beds, grow at the base of this unit. The unit is not laterally continuous, but may extend out to make the shoulder to our south. The contacts above and below are with the Denver Formation, which surrounds it and appear to be sharp contacts, though they're mostly covered up with vegetation and surficial debris. A closer look at unweathered surfaces reveals a dark crystalline rock with the crystals not lined up. This is an igneous rock with a fine matrix around larger crystals up to 5 millimeters long. These phenocrysts, as the larger crystals are called, turn out to be calcium-rich plagioclase, which we recall tends to have darker colors. So can you identify this rock? Fine crystals, not lined up, under 1 millimeter diameter with dark color suggests a basalt and the larger phenocrysts make this a porphyritic basalt. This rock came from a lava flow. We know this is a lava flow and not a sill because of the fine texture, the presence of a baked zone on the bottom but not on the top, as we see here from another exposure of this particular lava flow sequence. There are more bubbles or vesicles in the basalt towards the top, which is yet another lava flow characteristic sills do not possess. The technical name for this rock is Shoshonite, and it is part of the Table Mountain Basalt Group. The chemistry and texture tells us the magma source was mantle, so it had quite a journey to get through the crust to the surface, and apparently it paused on the way up within the crust and, and so took on potassium by incorporating the granitic country rock while waiting to surface which it did a few kilometers to our north in a series of what appeared to be fissure eruptions. Because this is an igneous rock, we can use potassium argon dating to give this unit an age of 64.2 plus or minus 1.1 million years ago. And look at that. We are younger than the 65.5 million years ago extinction event below, even with the error bar's reach. Superposition is working. The lower contact of our basalt flow has a U-shape, whereas the top contact looks flatter. This is the same morphology we get with stream channels, and the general shape of this lava is fingers of basalt that have four separate fingers entering on the north side of this mesa, three exiting on the south side, and in the kilometer it takes to cross Clear Creek Valley, these fingers have completely run out. This basalt lava flow appears to have been erupted as a slushy to our north and flowed southward, but was not thick enough to entirely cover the area and intended to take the low-lying stream channels across the surface at that time. And apparently there were four rivers of lava that ran in the area of this mountain. The surrounding Denver formation tells us the mountains are depositing on their flanks before this eruption and continue to do so after the eruption. Geologically speaking, we say the lava is intercalated with the Denver Formation. The Aa rubble on the west side of the outcrop, which looks to be under Pahoyhoy lava, might make one think there are two lava flows here, as Aa tends to be on top of a lava flow. But this is probably a rollover structure, with the top of the lava flow catching on the side of the old stream channel and getting flipped under the lava that ran over it. The cottonwood trees indicate a reliable water source here, and we note a couple other places on our trail where cottonwoods appear. We will investigate their distribution on the way up in an attempt to explain their presence here. Turning our attention to features of the Denver Formation at this location, we look on the other side of the road at the water tank that has been placed in the Denver Formation underlying our lava flow. 
Due to the fact that the Denver Formation consists of relatively unconsolidated sediment exposed on relatively steep slopes, it is a considerable risk for landslides. Oversteepening, as is seen on the backside of the platform built for the water tank, can cause failure like we are seeing here. But another concern, at a larger scale and a much more common trigger, is the addition of water. Water both adds weight and lubricates the sediment, which can turn a stable slope unstable. The lobe shape just on the far south side of the water tank looks like the toe of a large landslide that took place in the Denver Formation. In fact, the sides of our Table Mountains are predominantly landslide deposits. Residents at the base of this slope should be wary when the ground becomes saturated, and they should definitely hope that the water tank doesn't spring a leak. Turning back to the basalt lava flow, we see no evidence for more than one eruption event, and can say that all the lava flows at this level happened at once around 64.2 million years ago. Not only can we date igneous basalt using radiometric dating, we can also measure ancient magnetic fields trapped by the iron in the ferromagnesian basalt. As we walk up to the top of the lava flow, we see evidence of drill holes where cores were extracted for paleomagnetic studies. In just a matter of steps from this spot, we re-enter the Denver Formation sediments. The 64 million year old lava flow draped itself over a landscape of deposited sediment from the geologically recently uplifted Rocky Mountains, but once cooled and solidified, this basalt flow was buried by further deposition on the mountainous flanks.